Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. This week, the church in Antioch commissions Paul and Barnabas as we follow in the footsteps of the rabbi from Tarsus. We are so glad you've joined us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. And I am Jeffrey Seif, and we are on a journey together yes. with Rabbi Paul. And, and his journey is interesting. We know about the conversion, but then he goes back home and is kind of quiet for a little bit. Ten right? years, we don't know anything about him. Really, there's very little said about Paul. Uh, but like you alighted upon, ten years in the darkness, and he's called out fortuitously, providentially. And he found a friend. He had a friend, a confidant there. Yes, Barnabas believed in him, many didn't, as you know, and uh, the rest is history. Luke tells us there was a great persecution, that Paul was part of it. Luke tells us as well that good things happen as these disciples had to hit the road. Strange as that might sound, they were dispossessed, they had to move on, they lost property, friendship networks, and off they went to points east and west and north. And the question is, can God bring something marvelous out of the miseries? Their answer is yes. Luke tells us that up in a northern city called Antioch, the gospel spread with the movement of these believers that were difficulties notwithstanding, talking about what God was doing in the world beginning in Jerusalem. The net result is that the revival fires get started and they get flamed and something special is happening, so much so that word gets back to Jerusalem of the good news amongst the Jews and non-Jews in Antioch proper. They send someone to go check it out and that person's name was Barnabas and that man was amazed what God was doing. He knew of someone not far away in Tarsus named Paul. He'd been there the better part of 10 years now. Seemed to have been on the back waters, if you will, but God was just using him out there and preparing him for his future. Well, his future was going to arrive all right when he arrived in Antioch. And he came and he ministered, and this is going to be the beginning of new days for Paul, and there'll be a new dawn for the church. As we walk in the footsteps of the rabbi from Tarsus, we see how it's from Antioch proper where he starts to get sent out. And that sending is a story certainly worth uh, attending to, is it not? It's a good story. Rather than just talk about the Bible, let's hear from the Bible. If you'll look, please, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, we're told, And when he, that is Barnabas, found him, that is Saul or Paul, that he brought him to Antioch. So. It was that for a whole year that they assembled with the church and they taught a great many people. And then he says something interesting that's very revealing. He said, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. That for me is interesting for a few reasons. One, the Jewish believers in Yeshua and Jesus weren't called Christians initially. The term Nazarene was employed, you know, uh, just Jewish believers would have worked. It was, they were referred to as the way. There were different names, but the title name Christian was imposed upon them by outsiders who saw the movement beyond Judea and said, these are Christ-like peoples, uh, individuals that are trying to imitate this Messiah. And so they called them Christians first there. What for me is amazing is what the first Christians did. And would that those who walked the road in uh, subsequent generations did the same, I would indeed be a happy camper. Do you know 
what the first followers of Jesus did, those named Christians here in the literature. Let's consider the story as it moves on. In verse 27, we're told that in those days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. By the way, this shows a linkage between the Messianic movement headquartered in Jerusalem and this, uh, this daughter movement in Antioch proper. There's some kind of relationship. Would that today there were relationships between the church at large and the Messianic work in Jerusalem? I would be thrilled by that. Well, here you see there was, there's connectedness. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world appended to which Luke says, and this also happened the days of Claudius Caesar. Interestingly, it was this same Claudius who kicked all the Jews out of Rome. We know this from the historical records as well as Acts 18 in the very beginning that uh, Claudius kicked all the Jews out. And it seems that you know, he is unkind toward the Jews and then God sends famine in his, in his realm. Wonder if there isn't a subtle point here that if you bless those people, you'll be blessed if you curse those people, you'll be cursed. I think it is a little subtle, actually not so subtle, because in conjunction with this, in the wake of there being news about trouble dawning in Judea, these individuals referred to as Christians are beckoned to marshal their resources together to help the Jewish believers, to help Jews in Judea. Now my question is, where on God's earth is that spirit today? Trouble in Israel, Christians marshalling resources to be of assistance. It seems to me that we get the direct opposite today. There's trouble in Israel, and it seems that Christians, certainly mainline denominations, just get in line, they jockey for position to see who can condemn the Jews the most who can make it as difficult for the Jews as possible. They seem to compete for that prize. That's not the spirit here. It seems that those who were first called Christians in Antioch, that they were instructed to be of assistance to the Jewish folk in Jerusalem. It's a great story, isn't it? Well, Paul and Barnabas go down there with aid that was uh, gathered together in Antioch and they make their way to Jerusalem. They deliver that package and then they make their way back to Antioch. And it's from there then that God's going to bless them and send them to points. As we follow on Paul, we see how he makes his way out in the Greco-Roman world. And we'll follow him, of course, as we walk in the footsteps of this rabbi from Tarsus. Our resource this week, the Hebrew Names of God cards. This collection includes 12 vibrant, high-quality art cards, each with Old and New Testament connections on the back, with scripture and beautifully written devotionals. These art cards can be used for personal reflection, group discussion, or as a beautiful gift for your friend or pastor. For this resource and more, call 1-800-WONDERS or visit us at levitt.com. If you only watch us on television, you're missing additional content available only on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You can always visit our website, which is home base for all of our ministry activities and information. There you can sign up for our free monthly newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit the online store. You can sign up for a tour of Israel and Petra, or a cruise to Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. If you're not connected with us on social media, we have to say that you're missing out on a lot with this ministry. We are so thankful to all of you for your support, both on social media and yes. following us, but also your support of this program. In Hebrew, thank you is toda. So we would like to personally say to Dr. to all of you for making all of this possible and, and uh, Dr. Seif's teaching in Israel and across the Mediterranean because of you and your helping us financially, we are able to bring teaching from the Holy Land and actually uh, in the Mediterranean itself, right? right? Right now, Dr. Seif is literally standing in the Mediterranean Sea. Let's go there now. Enthusiasm 
comes from the Greek and theos, and it means in God. And you can bet that the rabbi from Tarsus was bristling with enthusiasm, and he'd need it too. He'd call upon that in God, that sense of inspiration. In spiritus means to breathe the spirit in. He needed it too because trials awaited him. As this man traveled over land, as he went by sea, as he endured shipwreck, as the hazards of the journey impinged upon him, many ways, many days, but onward he went, braving all the difficulties associated with the journey. And why is that? Because the rabbi from Tarsus was a man with a mission that they may know the Messiah of Israel in the world beyond Israel. He was called, destined from the womb, to be proactive in telling the greatest story ever told to the people that never heard the story. And off he went, commissioned from Antioch with his road bunny, Barnabas. He ventures westward. He will go from Antioch to Seleucia, and there he'll hop on the waters of the Holy Land, and he will ride atop the waves and make his way to Cyprus. First Salamis, and then overland from Salamis, he will make his way to Paphos, and from there he will make his way onto the Asia Minor mainland and go north. He'll go up to Antioch of Pisidia, he'll leave there, and he will turn east. He will go to Iconium, Lystra, Derby, turn around. This was a man that was not to be stopped. He had a story to tell. I want to look at his story in a moment, but I want to consider something of the storyteller. For Luke tells us in Acts in the 13th chapter that Paul, who had a vision for the world, came from a church that was constituted by people from the world. If you look in chapter 13, verse 1, you'll see there were prophets and teachers in Antioch proper. We learn of certainly uh, Barnabas was there. There's a fellow Simeon who was called Niger. Why was he called Niger? It's a Latin term for black. He was a black brother. He was there. We're told that Lucius of Cyrene was there. Cyrene was a major city in northern Africa. These weren't all Messianic Jews from Judea. Paul was in a church that was made up for different people from different parts of the world. And it's not coincidental that Paul's going to get a vision. Hey, you know, maybe we can take this story of a multicultural church and export this thing. See, he got it. He developed in that personally, socially, spiritually. We see here there was a fellow Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. He was a rich guy. In this church, there were rich and not so rich. There were black, there was white, if you will. It's a cosmopolitan group. Paul learned to appreciate different people. He learned what a fellowship looked like when it was made up of people that didn't look alike. And so what he does is he leaves the land, he goes to the sea, he gets off the sea, he goes up on dry land, and he tells the story of a Messiah who came for all. And indeed, what a story it is. We're gonna look at it in a second. Paul had a vision for a fellowship. A bunch of fellows in the same ship rowing together, all sorts of people. No one had that vision, but Paul did, and he exported it everywhere that he went. The image of a ship. Today in language, we think of fellowship, partnership, relationship. There's a lot of shipping going on. People working together to get the better of the waves, to move on top of it. Paul saw that's what God was up to in the world, and he broadcast that story. In the 13th chapter of Acts, Paul makes his way to Antioch of Pisidia. As his custom was, he goes into the synagogue. We'll see in verse uh, 14, he went there and he sat down. The rulers of the house, the leaders of the house, saw that, that, that he was a man of renown, a Jewish scholar, and they, they asked him to come up and share, and he does. We're told in verse 16 that, you know, in the wake of his invitation, he stands up, he motions, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Now, when he says you who fear God, he's not talking just generally about individuals who are uh, uh, reverential toward God. God fears is a term of individ for individuals of non-Jewish extract who want to participate with the Jewish people. 
It's interesting, the apostle to the Gentiles found his Gentiles in synagogues. They were half-baked Jews. Paul says, men of Israel and you grafted in sorts, listen to me. And he goes on and tells a story. He preaches the biblical story, the Old Testament story, with the Christological gloss, with, with an emphasis on Messiah. The net result is there's a stir. People say, well, the Jews kicked him out. Yeah, but that's a little overstated. Yes, Jewish authorities got angry, but the reason why they got angry is because a lot of the Jewish folk were following. It's overly simplistic to say all the Jews rejected him. They didn't. If you look in verse 42, same chapter, we're told, the Jews went out of the synagogue and the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Hey, the Jews and the Gentiles alike said, come on back, Paul. We're hungry. We want to hear this. But in the meantime, Luke tells us, when the congregation had broken, many of the Judeans, devout proselytes, followed Paul and Barnabas. And their so doing invoked the ire of the powers that be who then stir it up. What Luke shows in Paul's journeys is that the apostle to the Gentiles always went to the Jews first. What happens then? He ministers. There's some Jews that accept, some Jews don't. There's a, there's a stirring up, there's an upset, and he moves on. The apostle to the Gentiles always went to the Jews. That's why it says in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God for salvation to all men, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Tell me, where is that Jew first today? What we want to do is look at the Bible from a Jewish perspective and let the, the Jewish people know that the Messiah has come and let the Christian people develop a love for the Jews. This we get from Paul. We see it everywhere he goes and we'll continue to explore it as we walk in the footsteps of the rabbi from Tarsus. It seems that in Jerusalem proper, in proximity to the temple, there were porches roundabout, in one of which we're told that the believers met. Uh, it was a place called Solomon's Portico, and there they would teach and discuss the issues of the day. And there was a whole lot of discussion going on about a lot of things. Principal among them was the question, what on God's earth is the rabbi from Tarsus doing? Word had spread of his ministry to individuals of non-Jewish extract, and people were disconcerted. Prior to this time, those who followed Jesus were Jewish people. They were women and men of Jewish extract who lived and functioned as Jews. They were Jewish people who were for Jesus. But what now? Women and men of non-Jewish extract were coming in, but the question is, what do we do with them? There was a large segment that said, well, they must needs be assimilated into the community, and the way they do that is they would become Jews too. And this would entail circumcision, uh, kosher dietary laws, and other things. Well, Paul said, hey, listen, I didn't have them sign on the dotted line for that. Paul said, that's not what I advocated for. Paul was big enough and bold enough to cast a vision that this Jesus was for kol ha'am, all the people, kol ha'goyim, and that women and men of non-Jewish extract who came into the movement vis-a-vis -vis the agency of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, that they didn't need to become Jewish people in order to be good Christians. Well, no one had yet to, to advocate for this, and for Paul's doing so, he got in trouble. You know, good news moves fast. Bad news can be supersonic. And word got back to Jerusalem that Paul was up to no good. And they cried foul. What are we going to do? Did you know that there is confusion typically at the borders of knowledge? Did you know that people who innovate also confront in the process of their so doing. And so the net result is that right at the borders of knowledge, there can be chaos and confusion. It's all part of growing. And why is that? Because people are forced to think new thoughts, to expand the horizon, see things in new ways. It's not always comfortable, but it is what the cost of growth is all about. I like to lift weights in a gym, and there's an old saying there, no pain, no gain. When I'm running, I think of it. When I get under the barbells, I think of it. That what it is, is sometimes you have to struggle in order to get on to the future. Paul experienced that. 
what happened is Paul finishes that first missionary journey, and he's in Antioch proper, and then word is sent to uh, their brethren in Jerusalem that are advocating that Paul is in big trouble. And why is that? Because he's, he's teaching new things. And Paul gets called to the carpet. This issue, the issue of what to do with non-Jews who have become followers of Jesus, this issue was so big, it took in effect a full ecclesiastical council in order to deal with it. It was not a petty issue. It was indeed significant. Today, by the way, the shoe's on the other foot. Back then, the church was all Jewish. And when non-Jews are coming in, they're wondering, well, what do we do with them? Today, the church, in many respects, is not constituted by Jewish people like yesterday. And now the question is, well, what's incumbent upon these Jews who come in? Well, back then, the issue, as I'd said, was what to do with non-Jews. And it was tense. It was emotional. And Paul made his way to Jerusalem. He faced the crowd, and he advocated at this first council of Jerusalem where the early believers got together to weigh in on the issue of what will be incumbent upon women and men of non-Jewish extract who want to follow Jesus. Let's see what he had to say. Well, it was a mess, all right. The rabbi from Tarsus really stirred it up. They all had to get together. And I love the way that Luke describes he, 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 he lists the, the premier characters. In Acts chapter 15, verse 6, he says that the apostles and the elders came together. The apostles, these are the sent ones. These are the premier leaders and advocates for the movement. The elders comes from the Hebrew zakim, the bearded ones. This is a gathering of the men of renown, and they gather together to slug it out. We're told in verse 6 they came together to consider, and in verse 7 that there was, quote, much dispute. They couldn't come to terms with the question, what to do with you? This Jewish movement was wondering, what should we require of women and men of non-Jewish extract? And they slugged it out back and forth, back and forth. And then we're told in verse 7, though, that Peter rose up. Now that's good to see. Peter had a problem with being a bit sheepish. He tended to crater under pressure, but now he's got a little bit of chutzpah, a little bit of oomph, some guts, and he should stand up because Peter ought to know because previously in Acts, the Lord led Peter to Cornelius, someone from Italy. He was a centurion who was uh, there in uh, Caesarea Maritime, and Peter is sent to him, and he comes to faith. So Peter should know that God is on the move into hearts and minds beyond Israel proper. Well, Peter gets up, and he weighs in on it, and, and he weighs in on Paul's side, by the way. Sometimes they, they didn't get along, but, but he, he, he's with Paul on this one. We're told then in verse 12 that the multitude kept silent and they listened now as Barnabas and Paul. Could have said Paul and Barnabas because Paul was principal, but the truth is, is that Barnabas had equity with this group. He had given them a sizable donation previously and he'd let, uh, lived and dwelt among them and so they respected him the more so. Paul was the big question mark. He was the controversial figure. Well, what happens here is Barnabas and Paul talk about the signs and wonders, all that God is doing. And then finally, no less than Jesus Christ's half-brother stands up. We're told in verse 13 that Yaakov, James, is the, the, the anglicized equivalent for Yaakov, Jesus' brother. He stands up. He weighs in on the matter saying, men and brethren, listen to me. And what does he advocate for in verse 19? He says that we should not put any burdens on these women and men of non-Jewish extract. And this business tended to, the church agreed, that one needn't be a Jew in order to be a good follower of Jesus. We are in our second program of Paul's journey. Just the beginning, there's so much more that's happening in his life, but really interesting right now what's going on in his life, where he's at. 
Well, a lot of controversy, and that old boy certainly stirred it up. <laughs> uh, there's always confusion at the borders of knowledge, and he's doing something new, or the Lord's working through him to break some new ground. And the question is, what do we do? They were all Jews initially, but now they're non-Jews. Do they need to become like us? And they needed to, they sorted it out. They needed to fuss. They did. And they were kind of working on this manual, <laughs> so to speak. What do they do? What do they not do? What do we hold them accountable? What do we not hold them accountable? Yeah. And I understand because we're still dealing with that today. Yeah, church folk fuss today. They fight over what are the rules? How are we to do this thing? Uh, that was at play back then. Paul came on the side of liberating and freeing people up. In other words, he didn't make uh, Gentiles become Jewish. He didn't make Jewish become Gentile. You know, viva la différence. We need a little liberty here to be who we are. And unfortunately, we see this in the church all the time where church people, you've been a minister of music for so many years, when someone new comes in, we want to change them up. We, we almost don't like the package. So, you know, here, here are these Jewish followers of Messiah. We don't almost want the Gentiles in because they're so different in what they believe. Someone comes into our church and they look different or they act different or they talk different. And we're thinking, what do we do with them? We want to make them just like us. You know, and that's what I appreciate about you. That is to say, we're different. Uh, this isn't your garden variety church program. You know, we're all about the good news through the eyes of the Jews. And people say, you don't need to become like us. We want to get behind you the way that you are, and it's different. And I appreciate that. But frankly, it's hard to find a friend sometimes because we are different, and it's doubly hard to find a dollar. That's why I appreciate those of you that get behind us. Uh, we are like everyone in the sense we've accepted the Lord, I've accepted Jesus, but a little different because we still have feet and hearts and heads in Jewish culture. Thank you for finding value in what we do and helping us do it. We go all over the world. Paul's not the only one traveling. We're trying to keep up with him as we travel around the Mediterranean world. And thank you. It doesn't come on the cheap to go make these stories. Never mind, tell them globally through the miracle that is television. Thanks for helping make the miracle come true and supporting those of us that are a little different like us. <laughs> right. The stories that we bring our viewers, they're olden day scripture out of the Bible, but they're for us. And they relate to today. Right. Yeah. So much more on Paul coming up. I can't wait to hear about his life. We'll have to hear about it next week, unfortunately. Time's up. As you go now, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store. There, you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Our Jewish Roots help us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministry.